<laughs> Our next guest uh, from Pro Football Focus is uh, an impeccable draft analyst. He put together his mock draft. We're going to go through with him. But joining the show now, Mr. Trevor Sikama. Welcome to the show, Trevor. How are we doing? Hey, guys. Appreciate you having me on on uh, this Christmas Day morning. <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's go. It is. We've been doing our own mock draft here, um, guys. And, and kind of kind of like it would be for teams. If there's a, if there's a surprise pick, you know, uh, our, our, our DJ here, Mike, Mike Del Tufo, has to go, oh, my God, they, they took the guy I wanted to take. What do I do now? We, and he doesn't have the 15-minute time frame here to get it done. Um, what happens? Let's say I, I, I pulled something out of, out of nowhere. My first pick of the NFL draft was Kayvon Thibodeau for me tonight. What if that happens? How do teams react? What happens when a, when a bombshell move happens and, and they were already thinking they were going to get this one guy and they can't? They have a guy second on the list ready to go and, and it's, it's an easy transition or, or does it take them by surprise sometimes? Yeah, I mean, you know, when you look at a lot of these teams and when you listen to a lot of their pre-draft press conferences, if you take at least some of it at face value because we know they're not going to tell you everything, the part that we think has to be true every single year is that they go through multiple scenarios. And, you know, Jerry Jones was talking about this yesterday in his pre-draft press conference. Like, they go through everything. And he says there's nothing wrong with thinking about the craziness that might happen. You are not doing yourself a disservice taking even, even things that you wouldn't think would be a reality off the board. You want to run through it because, as everybody knows, with each pick in the NFL draft, the multiplier only increases with how crazy it could be. Now, the last couple of drafts, we've got such great reporters across the country who do such a great job covering their individual teams, a lot of those beat reporters in those markets, that we have a pretty good idea. But this year it does. It feels a little bit unknown. It feels like some craziness could happen in a multitude of different ways. So, look, if Kayvon Thibodeau were to go number one overall, I think it would still be Aiden Hutchinson who goes to the Detroit Lions. I think that's a prospect that they absolutely love and kind of that can't-miss hometown hero, if you will. And then the legendary John McClain, who covered the Houston Texans for so long, actually tweeted a couple of days ago, hey, if one of Trayvon Walker or Aiden Hutchinson makes to three, you better believe that they're going to be the pick at number three. So I think that in a short-term answer, it would probably go a little bit like that. But, you know, then we're opening up the field to so much other stuff for players that would have been interested in Thibodeau who now have to use contingency plans. So that's what makes it a lot of fun. Is there uh, something that you've heard or have been batted about a little bit, you know, the little the rumor mill that's going on, has there been something you have heard that may be a shocker, let's say in the top 10 picks that you've heard about? Well, I think, you know, the big report that was kind of swirling around yesterday is a different look at the top three that there's some projections out there that say Trayvon Walker's going number one, but then it's Kayvon Thibodeau that's going number two with Aiden Hutchinson on the board and then Derek Stingley going number three. And if that happens, you say to yourself, well, whoa, 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 hold on. Where's Aiden Hutchinson going? Because at that point for the New York Jets, we know they like Ike Aquanu. But has Aiden Hutchinson changed the formula for them? Do they like Aiden more than they like Icky? Maybe they stick with Icky Aquanu. Maybe they think that he's so high on their board they can't miss on him. Then what do the Giants do? Are they taking Aiden Hutchinson? And so all of a sudden, that <laughs> is one of those things where it really throws a wrench into what could be the trickle-down effect if the draft starts like that. You know, I'm very curious to see what the Seattle Seahawks do at number nine overall. Are they a team that's going to trade up? I don't think they're a team that's going to trade back. They've gotten so much back from the Russell Wilson trade. But how aggressive are they going to be? And we just we don't have a lot of historical answers, guys, because they never pick in the top ten. Ever since they've had Russell Wilson, they've never been a team that has picked this high. So now they've got a quarterback need. They've got a lot of other needs as well. What is Seattle, an unknown team, going to do? And, look, they could move up a couple of spots. Maybe they like Derek Stingley. Maybe they like Kayvon Thibodeau. We've heard some whisperings of that as well. But, guys, I'll tell you, the ultimate wild card I feel in this class is Trevor Penn. Because the offensive tackle from Northern Iowa, I feel as though a lot of teams love him. Right after the Senior Bowl and right after the Combine, we saw a couple of mock drafts with him going in the top ten. Number seven overall to the New York Giants, if that's the way they wanted to go. To, to nine to the Seahawks, eight to the Atlanta Falcons, right? And so I've seen his name all over the place. The range for that prospect is very vast, and he plays a premium position at offensive tackle that will obviously have a trickle down depending on how high he goes. So those are a handful of scenarios that I've seen over the last 
24, 48 hours that could really shake up the status quo, if you will. All right. Well, uh, speaking of, of your mock draft, let's go to that, at least for your top 10 as of right now, because it's going to disappoint our uh, our namesake here at the Rich Eisen Show because of who you have at three and four. So why don't you uh, why don't you let us know what your what your top ten looks like in your final mock draft? All right. So at, the, at number one, now this is my best guess. This is this is me basically pulling all my sources that I possibly can to make a best educated guess of what I think is going to happen here. I got the Jaguars going Trayvon Walker at one, Hutchinson. I got going two to the Lions, Sauce Garner. I got at three. Uh, to the Houston Texans, Jets at four going Icky Aquanu. Uh, New York Giants, I got them going Charles Cross at, at five. Carolina Panthers, no quarterback. I got them going Evan Neal at number six. Giants, seven, Derek Stingley. Uh, Falcons, eight, Drake London, who I've been told that they love. I really have been. Seattle Seahawks, I got them sticking at nine, taking Kayvon Thibodeau. And then the Jets, I got them routing out with Jermaine Johnson at 10. So what you guys got issue with the three and the four? Is that what I'm hearing there with the, uh, well, the well, I, rich, wow, rich would man. be incredibly disappointed because he's been all about the sauce, just all about the sauce at the four spot. And so it would, it would disappoint him. I, I, I would, I would believe, but I, I understand it. I mean, he's in, he's a, could be a generational player, six foot, 390 pounds with the reach at a cornerback position. I, I, me as a quarterback, whenever I saw somebody looking like that, you know, you, you, you steered away from, from that aspect of things, so I, I fully under, I get I get where you're coming from on that end of things. It's just uh, it, it would it, it's going to upset Rich. That's the that's the whole point. In this. <laughs> so look, I I obviously I'm pretty big on sauce because I've got him off the board uh, before number four overall, and it makes sense why the Jets will be interested. But I'm not going to lie, guys, I haven't heard a ton of buzz or logic for sauce even going number four overall not because they wouldn't need him certainly they need to upgrade their quarterback their cornerback position but joe douglas is a guy who likes to build through the trenches and if they believe that they have a trench need or a player that they just straight up really love in the trenches that's going to be alluring for them and i think it's going to take precedent in a top five pick robert sala loves to build through the front he loves to build through the front seven and if they believe they need to get better at pass rush then I think that would even take precedent at number four overall. So really, yes, they need a corner, but there's also a decent chance that the Jets could get a pretty dang good corner at the top of the second round. I think they realize that as well. And I just, from from going throughout the whole process, the people that I've talked to who are very in the know with the Jets, it doesn't seem like Sauce would be ahead of guys like Iki Aquanu, uh, like Kayvon Thibodeau. Uh, like Jermaine Johnson, those players that they would have in the trenches that they might covet at those premium picks that they have in the top 10. So Sauce, great player. He'd be a great New York Jet. I just don't know how high he is on the board compared to those trench guys. Yeah, that's a good point. I, and then if that were the case and I was trying to console Rich Eisen, I would tell him that there's going to be a great corner out of Washington that may be able to uh, – you might be able to pick up named Kyler Gordon – uh, at the top of the second round that that could fit your fit your needs there and get the two things you need at 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 four and ten so we'll see how it plays out all right um you know some of the conversation for me especially from the pac-12 conference has been Devin lloyd and it almost feels like the new england patriots pick where you have them uh, at 21 seems like the perfect fit but he he's a player that i saw wreck shop and was once considered maybe a top 10 pick what has what has affected that? And if you are anybody else in the NFL and you have seen all the mocks and you see that this is a perfect fit for, for the likes of Bill Belichick, why wouldn't you interrupt that and try to get in front of that and steal a guy that, that you know is going to be pretty impactful at the NFL level? Yeah, the, the talk about Devin Lloyd has been, I don't want to say strange, it's just kind of been all over the place because it seems like people really like him. Right. But I don't know how many teams love him. And the way that I've looked at off-ball linebacker, which, let's face it, guys, is not picked as a premium position normally is that unless you are an uber athlete, uh, you know, if you test like a Devin White or a Devin Bush or like last year we saw with Jamin Davis, unless you are this crazy athlete, we just don't see that position be used with a lot of premium picks. And so I do think that kind of maybe the middle, maybe the early 20s, area of the first round is a good spot for Devin Lloyd. But I think whoever's getting him is getting a really good football player. Now, the Patriots, I struggled a little bit with this because I I would love a linebacker selection for them. But Devin Lloyd definitely isn't their type that they have drafted in the past. Normally they go with more heavier set inside linebackers that can really attack the line of scrimmage, whether it's blitzes or off the edge. Now, Devin Lloyd gives you a lot of skill 
as an edge rusher off the edge and as a blitzer. But he's not heavier. You know, you look at what Dunta Hightower has been as an anchor in the middle of that defense for so long. Devin Lloyd doesn't bring that kind of power to the position. But he might be that next generation, right? When they, when they drafted Dunta Hightower, football was at a different stage. Now we're getting spread out more. You're playing more nickel than you are base. You've got two linebackers on the field, not three. You're not as heavy in your personnel on defense because you're trying to counter the speed of offenses. Devin Lloyd gives you that great feel and coverage. He gives you that agility. He gives you that speed. And maybe he's a guy that they would pick as that next chapter, if you will, as a guy to be the centerpiece of that defense. And so beyond the Patriots, I think that there's a couple of different teams that would certainly love him in the first round. But his range definitely feels like it's mid-first round to late first round. But I still think he should be a first-round prospect, no question. All right, you may have answered this already a little bit with the Trevor Penning uh, conversation, but is there a guy that most people have in their mock drafts or analysts think that from 15 to 30 that that may or 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 or, or on the back end of the first round could go much higher uh, than what's expected? Is there a surprise player that could surprise us and go higher than than those that expect it? Yeah, a couple of them come to mind. I think that Trevor Penning is one of them. His range seems to be all over the place, but even like sneaky into the top 10. But it feels like he's probably going to go somewhere in the middle of the first round. The two Penn State players that a lot of people view as fringe first-round prospects, edge rusher Arnold Ebikade and then wide receiver Jahan Dotson. I think both of those players, Ebikade because of how explosive he is, how great of a speed rusher, how effective he was, 18 tackles for loss this past season. Him, I think anytime you've got that athleticism as an edge rusher, teams are going to cover you. And I think that he could go even into the late teens. We might see something like that tonight or early 20s. So that's a little bit higher than most are projecting. And same with Jahan Dotson. If a team really needs a wide receiver, I think that that's kind of the same ceiling of range. He could go middle of the first round into the 20s as well. So those are a handful of players. I think Logan Hall, too, the defensive lineman from Houston. Look, I, I've seen him plenty of places. The Buccaneers at number 27. The Cincinnati Bengals at number 31. I've even seen him as high as number 22 to the Green Bay Packers. And this is a player who's not even in everybody's first-round mocks, but I think that when you look at the combination of how versatile he is with the length, the body frame, the power he has in his lower body, the speed that he can bring in as a pass rusher, and yet how stout and long he can be as a run defender, whether you're playing an even front or an odd front, I think he's casting a very wide net of all of the teams that he could potentially go for. And that kind of versatility, some teams really, really covet. So I think those are a handful of names that come to the top of my head when I think of, okay, could go a little bit earlier than what we're seeing right now. All righty, Trevor Sikama, everybody, from Pro Football Focus, filling us in on everything uh, with tonight's NFL draft. Um, I'll get you out of here with this question. First quarterback off the board, and where does he go? Man, this, you, left the, you left the best one for last, didn't you? Yeah. This is the one that everybody wants to know the answer to. I'm still going to say Malik Willis. I'm still going to say Malik Willis, and I think that it's going to be the Pittsburgh Steelers some way, somehow. I don't think it'll be at 20. I think they're going to have to trade up a little bit for him. I don't think they're going to get super desperate trading all the way up into the top 10. But I think that somewhere in the teens, middle of the first round, Steelers are going to pop up and go get him because – the only, th the only spot that I really think could go ahead of Malik Willis is if Kenny Pickett goes to the Carolina Panthers at number six, and I just don't think that's going to happen. It's on the table, but I wouldn't be betting for it. So instead, I would still bet Malik Willis, QB1 off the board to the Pittsburgh Steelers. And uh, just for everybody's information, because you saw his mock come up here on the, on the television screen as well, you have Atlanta jumping back into the first round to get that quarterback in Kenny Pickett. I do. Yeah, I think that somebody is going to jump up into the back end of the first round. It's too prime, right? The uh, Kansas City Chiefs have two picks at 29 and 30. You figure they're probably going to move on from one of those if they get a really great deal that gets them some draft capital next year. Cincinnati Bengals at 31. I know they don't trade too much, but they might get a trade offer. They can't refuse there to move back a little bit with the team jumping up. And then Detroit Lions, I think, have their phones on as well. So I think we're getting a quarterback somewhere within those last five picks of the first round, whether it's quarterback two or quarterback three. I think we're getting a quarterback right there. Awesome, man. You're locked in. Uh, appreciate you jumping on and, and filling us in a little bit, educating us for the big night tonight. Uh, you have a blast. Enjoy your Christmas morning. I appreciate it, guys. You enjoyed it as well. Anytime. All right, Trevor Sikama, everybody from Pro Football Focus. All right.
Hey, you watched all the way to the end. Thanks for that. Watch more right here.